Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Keith Graham. I'm uh, the vice president of the university program and customer experience at uh, CODICEP. And my experience is pretty wide. I actually was in industry. So I've actually seen the trend of custom compute or everyone was doing their own processor to our, you know, where we went to a very few architectures and now the growth of RISC-V. And I've also taught at the University of Colorado. So as a teaching professor, one thing I, I like to get in my class is to actually ask questions during my lecture. And so I want you to ask questions. And I actually do have questions for you throughout my presentation. So I would like to get some uh, interaction going. My first uh, RISC-V summit was six years ago. And at that summit, it was actually at Western uh, Digital. And it was very much, I uh, get back to what uh, Calista was saying, it was very much, I would say, a hobby or a research, right? Almost every presentation was on a university working with another university doing research on some type of computer architecture, and maybe with collaboration with some uh, company. But it was basically a very much of a university summit until Western Digital came and, and spoke. So uh, Martin Fink, who is the Western Digital CTO at, at that time, basically made the announcement that Western Digital was moving towards RISC-V. And that was a big announcement because that really started the transition from the uh, academic research of RISC-V into commercialization. Then I took off and, and I hadn't attended a RISC-V summit for many years until last year. I was really impressed because now, when I was there last year, there were so many companies now doing the presentations. It's no longer just in the realm of research. So this was a really a big event about six years ago when Western Digital was the first company, major company, that made a stake that said, we are going RISC-V, and not just RISC-V, we're going to take what we learn in RISC-V and put it back into the community. And that's the advantage of an open uh, standard type of community. Now, I have a few questions. And so once again, my uh, presentation is why RISC-V. So uh, I did a little research last week. And so uh, what is expected when you look at uh, IoT, uh, Internet of Things and AI, what do you think is the revenue expected for 2022? Well, actually, it wasn't expected. This was actually done. So any idea out there? 3.1 billion we have? I feel like an auctioneer now, 3.1 billion. Any other ones? 10 billion. So 10 billion. Okay, so $10 billion was in 2022 in AI uh, for IoT. Now, what do you think it is in 2028? We got 6 billion. We got 6 billion. Any, any other bidders? What's that? Uh, 50 billion. Anyone else? Well, we're going to have to go with 50 billion because you're the closest, but it's still pretty way off. It's 92 billion. So we're looking at a phenomenal growth in AI uh, IoT. Now let's take a look at DSPs 2023. It's a little bit of older technology. It's not really like a AI, which is everyone is is uh, focusing a lot of uh, research and development on. But what do you think um, DSP revenue was forecasted in 2023? We got 10 billion. Now, it's one of those things, if I see you like do this, I'm going to call you and figure out how much you bet on. Um, so it is actually $5 billion uh, uh, this year. So what do you think is the DSP revenue expected for 2029? We got $100 billion? We got $100 billion? What's that? Seven. Seven. You're the closest one. It's actually $6.6 .6 billion. That's a really nice number there. So... My big question is, when we look at these markets, we've got uh, AI, Internet of Things, and we got DSP. Now, what differentiates these markets from the general purpose processor or microcontrollers? I, you know, when I came up with the, the focused on the revenue, it just said AI. It didn't specify AI or ML specific. It just said AI. So I, I apologize. I can't be more specific on that. So what differentiates these uh, potential uh, revenue streams compared to the general purpose markets or microcontrollers? Power consumption, Power consumption is one, especially uh, IoT, right? A lot of those are batteries, so it's very much uh, low energy. Anything else? 
size. Size is related to cost, and also size is somewhat related to uh, power as well, as well as the end product is normally small. Anything else? Security, yes, because you're no longer you're broken from the barrier, right? You're not in a closed uh, computer room anymore, right? So you're in the wild. Anything else? Uh, it could be vector processing depending upon your application, correct? Correct. There's a, also a really nice balance on IoT specifically, you know, how much uh, you want to actually do local versus in the cloud because there's a, you know, your bandwidth to the internet and so forth. So in essence, each application has a different set of requirements, right? You think, you know, we just talked about a lot of different responses that would differentiate. It really depends on what your application is, right? Where when you think of a general purpose processor that goes in your notebook, well, most notebooks have the same type of requirements, right? Most, say, Linux operating systems we're talking about uh, different platforms, right? So that you can run that Linux on whatever platform, right? So they have a much more common set of requirements. So when you take a look at these particular markets, which actually have large dollars, large growth, require dif uh, differentiation. Now, we're going to go back in time. So actually, I existed. I worked for this company down here called Soulborn. We were doing a custom processor back in the 87. And so back in 87, uh, it was probably about 89, Sun Microsystems came to us and said, no one's going to buy your custom processor, right? As, as a startup, you don't like to hear that, right? And, but they were right. And what they said was, software is going to be more important than hardware, right? And at that time, everyone was doing their own processor. I mean, I worked at Hewlett Packard, you know, Sun Microsystems, all those companies were doing the custom processors. And unless your company can guarantee a, pl a hardware platform for at least 10 years, no one's going to port their software to your, your base, your, your processor. So they convinced us, and Soulborn became the very first Sun-compatible uh, uh, processor in the world. So we switched over, and we did a, a Spark-compatible processor. And so then we entered the 90s. Some of those architectures ended up dying. And we focused on more x86 and ARM were the big players, but MIPS was there as well. And so when I started teaching at the University of Colorado uh, in the uh, mid-2010s, I had some students ask me, I'd like to be a processor engineer. And I go, well, I don't mind helping you learn how to do that, but there's not a lot of companies to work for unless you want to work for like Intel, ARM, you know, AMD, NVIDIA. There's just a, hand, a small handful. But what I think we're going to be seeing here is what I call the next golden age of processor engineering. And it's being driven by all these different products that need differentiation, right? You know, we got um, EVs, we got drones, we got space, um, uh, robotics, even um, commercial products, consumer products, right? Uh, all these different products are going to create a need for differentiation. And it's been really amazing to think that you, there's a lot of software companies out there that you think are software companies, but they are a very large spender of hardware. Because they understand that differentiation is not always software anymore, but it is how well your software runs, particularly how well does it run in the cloud. So there's a lot of customization in hardware, and we're gonna be seeing is this strong demand for unique processing capabilities out there, which is uh, uh, custom compute. The nice thing about this is as long as you're risk five and you add resources and not take resources away from your processor, you can still run the base software that's available in the risk five ecosystem, but anything that's compiled specifically for your processor will get the benefits of that particular architecture. Now, I used to, uh, this is a, pr uh, a few slides that I would start my classes with in computer architecture was um, I really like pizza. If anyone knows me there, I have a lot of stories on pizza. And um, if I want to make 16 ounces of pizza sauce, in the United States, it's a little difficult because my choice of cans of tomato sauce are 8, 15, and 28 ounces, right? But I want 16 ounces of pizza sauce. So how do I do that? Well, I could use one can of 28, two cans of 15, uh, which I have a lot of leftover t 
tomato sauce, or two eighths. But two eighths, like two cores at eight, is not always the same single thread processing as a single 16 uh, ounces of tomato sauce. So the idea is, can we take a smaller can of tomato sauce or processor and then add the functionality or resources to make it equal to 16? Now, the beauty about going from the smaller to larger, I can actually specialize it for my particular application. So now my 16 ounces is not just tomato sauce, but it's actually pizza sauce. So um, by specializing, you can actually provide additional value to your uh, uh, in market. And the thing is, if I start with a smaller core, a lot of times I can actually have a less expensive solution as well. So there's a lot of advantages of going small and up. Uh, CodaSip has a, a, a few white papers uh, where we show where someone's taken a small core and through custom compute has actually enhanced the performance dramatically for their particular end market. Now, there's always a potential need that you need a lot of pizza sauce. So I actually have this for my spaghetti when I make spaghetti. That's a lot of sauce. Um, but you might have a need for actually something completely custom. And the thing is, RISC-V allows you to do, do that as well. Now, let's take a look at uh, what if I do not uh, do custom compute, right? Remember I said that I might have to go with a larger can of, of tomato sauce for what I need. Now, if I pour that can, or if I look at this, the 16 ounces is a lot smaller than my, say, uh, 28 ounce can of tomato sauce, right? So if I look at that area compared to if I bought an off-the-shelf processor that had the type of resources I need, I get what I call IP lefto leftovers, right? The leftovers is uh, a larger area, which is uh, related to cost. Uh, a lot of times, more power, which is re related to greater energy usage. Uh, so there's a lot of additional costs that you are paying for if you, if you uh, take a standard compute for these particular marketplaces. Now, you need some more reasons, right? That, that's a great reason, right? And when you look at, uh, at, uh, at companies, there's a lot of different levels of management when they decide on what processor or a key technology to choose on, right? The low-level uh, low engineers have to validate that it technically will work, right? It has to work. Then you go up the management chain, and there's a manager there that needs to ensure that the product's going to release on time and on schedule. And then when you go all the way up to the vice president, the vice president normally is responsible for increased profit. So these are all decisions that have to go hand in hand. Now, the last slide is, is talking about how you can actually ensure that you have the best feature set for the product. But now let's take a look at that next level of management, because that's another thing, a person you have to discuss about why risk five. Now, this is actually a real customer experience that I know. So they designed a, uh, they spent two years designing a SOC with an ARM chip. And when they started the project, they tried to figure out what was the right size core for my application. So they started the development, they chose the core, and they finally got their first uh, uh, silicon back. And they realized that the software between the, over the two years uh, bloated so bad that when they actually got the silicon, now they can't meet the specification requirements of the application to actually sell the product, right? So that is a, a, uh, a big risk management issue. Now, the question is, you know, if I have this example where I have to go from 16 to 20 ounces, if I have a closed architecture, I can't do anything about it. If I want to go make the change from, say, one class of ARM or a proprietary processor to another, that's a big change potentially to your layout and design. Where on the other hand, if I use RISC-V, I can go and figure out what are the new dedicated resources and do an incremental change to my design to enable me to continue with my current SOC. I might have to spend my ASIC again, but now I'm doing a minor change and not a major change. So I really believe that RISC-V also provides time to market and risk mitigation that you do not get because of the ability to customize your core. Oops. 
Now, get back to the why, right? We talked about earlier we had instruction set open standard. It is enables us all to take a look at uh, our, uh, I like how you mentioned, uh, John, where you, we can differentiate the way we solve problems, right? Um, module ISA to match processor resources to the application. So that is the ability that you can get the basic uh, extensions so that your software that you might want to procure on the open source will fit from one solution to another. But we do have the ability to actually customize, either add custom instructions or add extensions that will actually provide your application with additional benefits. Um, so RISC-V uh, uh, Nonprofit Foundation maintains the stability, which is, uh, I think we, uh, John mentioned before, is a very key part of this, right? So that we understand that we have a stable um, uh, foundation. For example, if you're using the M extension, once it gets frozen, you are comfortable that it will stay, right? And that if I'm in M uh, extension compatible, then uh, I can run M extension compatible software. Development of open source drivers, operating systems, and tools, that's part of the ecosystem. We have a growing ecosystem. Remember back in uh, 1989, we were told we could not support a, you know, our Soulborn's computer or processor wouldn't be able to be sold because no one would create an ecosystem for a single vendor with a new architecture. But with all the different companies who are supporting RISC-V, the ecosystem is growing. So there's a, a growing uh, amount of open source drivers, operating systems, and tools, which enables you to uh, implement your RISC-V. So I'm going to do a demo tomorrow at 2.30. Um, so in the uh, demo theater, uh, it's uh, through customization, architect your ambition. So I will actually uh, be doing a demo on how you can actually customize your processor. And the demo will include so, uh, several different ways of improving your uh, ISA for a particular application, as well as improving your architecture for an application. So it's a way of architecting your ambition to meet all these different type of processor needs that you need for the IoT and DSP markets. And here's my contact information. Uh, please uh, 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 contact me if you have any questions. Um, I'm based here in Seattle, but I actually uh, uh, have responsibility globally. So I do run the uh, university program, and we are actually uh, actively engaged in three pillars. One pillar is we actually um, sponsor PhD students and research for master thesis projects. We also support um, professors in their uh, research and in their projects. We actually have a dedicated support team working with the universities, which I think is really unique that we have a dedicated set of innovation engineers working with universities. And lastly, we also, and lastly, we, lastly, we also create curriculum uh, and make available for free for the uh, uh, universities if they would like to uh, do some project-based learning uh, regarding RISC-V. So that's, what, that's my presentation for day, to today. Uh, hopefully, uh, you can make it to the demo tomorrow. But is there any other questions that you might have? Yeah, you know, in, in theory, the RISC-V architecture is meant to support all different implementations of it because it's an ISA standard, right? So, but it's a digital standard. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So I, I apologize, I don't have enough experience to, to address that one, but I don't I see. Would be the main yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. I mean, actually, th these are the type of problems that I like to actually uh, do do work on. <laughs> so actually a couple of people from CODIS have known those are the things that I like to work on. So yes, I'd like to talk more about that. Uh, anything else? Any other questions? Thank you very much for everyone who was brave and actually uh, answered my questions. So uh, I appreciate the time to talk about uh, RISC-V.